Welcome to Resounding, a podcast exploring the power of the arts in advocacy and in action. We talk with artists and activists, taking a deep dive into questions surrounding the causes of displacement, the strength and the vulnerability of people on the move, and the potential of the arts to shine a light on social injustice and impact people's lives for the better. This month we spoke with Zena Edwards, writer and activist, unpacking the personal, communal and political implications of Article 27 of the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to welcome Zena Edwards to our podcast and to this event on June 20th. Uh, Zena, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks very much for agreeing to this and, and giving your time so that we can hear from you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very interested in the work. Very interested. So we're recording today for the Resounding podcast of Art27 and for the event on June 20th, which is co-hosted by Art27 and Musicians Without Borders. I'd love as a starting point to discuss that very thing, the Article 27 that Art27 is based on. Everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. Everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which he is the author. It's a hell of an article. It is. <laughs> uh, it, it really is. Um, and I think from a cultural producer's perspective, which is what I think artists, I believe artists to be, we are the producers of culture. And also for my personal manifesto, of being public servants in that we provide we, we provide culture we, we serve the community through our crafts you know um, I believe that there's a saying there's a quote and I, I really it's, it's it's gone around you know when there's a quote that's gone around so much that we're never sure who the source is um, but there's yeah. a quote that says um creativity uh, is the immune system of the mind, and that was I, I learned that quote from a youth project that I was working on uh, about in 2010, and it's really it really resonated with me, and I just thought yes, you know, like creativity is um, an art is something that is um, provides us with well being because it helps us to see ourselves, it helps us to process the world, it helps us to process some of the difficult things in the world. Um, and there are so many different access points to the art that we create. So if you think about an article that protects, A, the artists, the ones who are making the art, and B, it ring fences space in our, in our lives, in our existence, where we are able to consume, consume, let's say, imbibe of, be nourished by creativity and art. Because I think it is so much a part of our mental health and well-being is being able to enjoy art, to explore ourselves, explore who, are, who we are, um, express ourselves, express our identities, express our voices, express our humanity. Because people have been making art since time immemorial. You know, there's cave paintings on the wall. People have been making art. People mm -hmm. have been dancing. People have been using their voice, expressing mm -hmm. themselves through song whether it had wor has words to it or it didn't have words to it, you know, however many tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago that humans began, you know, um, we've always had needed mm -hmm. to express ourselves. So I think to have an article, to have something written down in, in a concrete form uh, that I believe that a group of people sat down in a room and decided we are going to put this uh, principle, this tenet, this code of conduct this more you know down on paper yeah. we're going to concretize concretize this principle which as a human as a right as a right to human to our humanity it's for me i think it's an important um i think it's an important testimony of our ability mm -hmm. to understand how important art and culture is and art and creativity is yeah yeah i agree completely of course and, and you know the idea that it's also protecting the artist Funnily enough, mm -hmm. I've never read it that way. But you're mm -hmm. right, of course. I always think of this as this kind of abstract process that people have the right to culture as if culture is just going to happen. 
but there's and and that's the obstacle people can't access it but of course it's also about as you say cultural producers people yeah. uh, that create culture even then i'm i'm opening up that bigger question of of how cultural's viewed within this statement which which always draws my attention you know participate in the cultural life of the community uh, as i say that i'm a bit confused by it do, how, how do you interpret that well i think we can have lots of uh, uh, conversations about like what is culture. Culture is created through the need to feel like you belong somewhere, that you see yourself reflected somewhere through other people. It's something that you do collectively. You know, you, culture doesn't just happen. Culture, culture um, is a collective act, I think. The creation of it. I mean, I, I made some notes here. It's belonging. It's alignment. It's representation, expression, the connection and the creation of culture is the manifestation of the collective of a collective life experience. And a lot of that will be informed by the land that you live on. So a lot of if you think about culture, it, it's reflected through nature. Our connection to the earth yeah. is a massive, a massive inspiration, I think, for humans. You know, but obviously there, there's a tricky area where, which I think we, as a species, we beautifully navigate. If you have a culture that um, comes from the land that you live on, for example, and then that land becomes colonized and that land becomes oppressed and the people on the land are oppressed and things like erasure happens, you know, erasing of people's culture as a power tool. So let's talk about the, in the Caribbean, the people who were brought there uh, through the, the history of chattel enslavement. You had your culture, which would have been a religious culture, say, from West Africa, the Orishas, for example, and then that would be fused with Catholicism. And then that, that sort of mashup, that fusion together, that's a transmutation, that's an evolution of, yeah. of a culture. But ultimately, it's still about expressing, it's still about belonging, it's still about um, seeing yourself in the world, having value, you know. Um, so I think... Um, Culture itself is is a is a shifting thing, yeah. But because it's so closely linked to our identity, who we believe ourselves to be, and who we believe ourselves to be reflected by other people, then I think protecting the people who make that work because they they, they end up being on the front lines. If you're on the front lines of a revolution, but you're singing, or you're writing poetry, or if you're drumming, for example, the, you know the slaves were not allowed to drum. So we have to understand that the power of culture, the power of art communicates our human spirit. It communicates our tenacity and our resilience. And just moving this into the space of looking at people with refugee status, seeing art that's made for people who are in those precarious positions that have done this kind of work, it, it's, it's such a profound experience. You have to really humble yourself uh, because you're seeing right before your eyes something being created. I did a lot of work with collage. Uh, collaging with, mm. with some people because English wasn't their first language. Uh, B, mm. sometimes the things they were talking about were so traumatic, you couldn't ask them to speak it. But mm -hmm. if you give people newspapers or, or magazines and say, and, and a pair of scissors and some glue and paper, tell your story through your eyes, through visuals. Uh, and the doors that it opened up, I mean, it really op opened people's hearts and they didn't yeah. feel as though they were just a statistic or a case study but they felt seen. Just continuing from that, that idea of, of um, linking to refugees, we, we were talking on Refugee Day, of course. Yeah. Migration and, and culture are obviously very interesting concepts to think of together. That it, it brings us to ideas of kind of politicization of culture pretty quickly, that, mm. you know, whose culture, who gets to control what culture is. The idea that if people arrive in a new country, that integration becomes a big word, I think. And then cultural integration becomes very dangerous and political and uh, about power instantly it is it's in, instantly a, a power equation uh, i mean it's, it's it's so important what you're saying because um i think there are a lot of just going to speak frankly um there was a uh, this was in 2014 there was some a, a, a show called exhibit b uh by a south african artist called brett bailey uh that uh, came to to the UK was invited by the Barbican uh, to put on his piece called The Human Zoo. Theatrically, it was an interesting concept, but he wasn't really looking at the climate or the Barbican weren't taking into consideration the climate of the moment. It was when Mike Brown had been shot. Uh, it was when there was a whole thing about Tamir Rice, a young 12-year-old boy had been shot by the police. 
Uh, so there was, it was one of the rise of the Black Lives Matter. I think it was the first wave, actually, of Black Lives Matter, really. And um, the Barbican decided to put on this piece called Human Zoo, which was where it was making the black body in, in all its brutalised forms uh, throughout colonial history as a spectacle based on, in Europe, there used to be these things called the human zoos for black people were brought over from Africa and actually put in zoo settings for people to gawp at and point at and they would be fed, you could feed them as if you were feeding, you know, a, a, an animal in the zoo. Uh, and he wanted to kind of make very beautiful, because uh, it was, that the theatrical setting was very beautiful, but you can't br- make beautiful the terrorisation of a colonial experience if it's happening to you. You can't make that beautiful. So he chose to um, contemporise or bring it up to date by, by theatricalising the, the death and murder of Jimmy Mabenga, who was being deported, uh, and he was murdered by tape being wrapped around his face. They stuffed, I think, a sock in his mouth and put loads and loads of tape around his face, and he suffocated and died on a, on a plane that was taking him back to his country. And I just thought this, you can't have this very brutal piece of theatre in this climate. And there was a whole campaign called uh, Boycott the Human Zoo, which I decided as an artist to side with that side of the campaign where there was a lot of people because it became a massive national conversation about who has the power to platform what work, what kind of artwork. There were a lot of there was a lot of division, uh, and the, the the whole of the cultural sector, the art sector, were having massive conversations about this. Brett Bailey was in the middle of this, loving the attention. But the point of the matter is that the Barbican has the power to put this event on, and decided that it, regardless of people who were saying this is our ancestors, our ancestors are being put on a platform of where they were terrorized, and we don't agree with this. But as an artist, I chose to side with the boycott in the human zoo, knowing that I may never work again because it was such a public platform, knowing that I might not get booked because there were so many arts institutions who were saying, this is censorship. And I'm like, who's censorship? We're being censored but by being told that this is a piece that we feel is offensive. We get censored every single day when we make applications for funding, for example, and we don't get it, but we see our white artist counterparts getting funded for all sorts of different stuff. We get censored when we're told that what you're producing isn't quality, when actually we don't have opportunities to fail, which is where we learn, right? The creative process is you have to make mistakes. You know, you have to make mistakes. So if we don't have opportunities to fail so that we become better at our craft, that is censorship. So, and then there's privileged censorship where it's just like, well, because my name looks foreign, um, we're not going to put this through as somebody who can get applications for, for some kind of uh, bursary or something like that. So I'm just saying that there's so many obstacles us as artists um, yeah. have to go through, when we're particularly artists of colour. So this is where culture becomes politicised. This is where me being understood in my entirety as a black woman of Caribbean descent may not be fully understood or accepted as the version of black because it doesn't fit the narrative of what an institution or or an established organization thinks what blackness should be like, how black art fits very comfortably in the narrative that they understand and that they respect. And and sometimes that is fetishization. Sometimes it's, it's struggle politics. Uh, you know, that's very sexy to see people like angry and struggling, you know, black power, that kind of stuff. Or sometimes it's or trauma politics, like seeing us in trauma all the time, talking about our trauma. You know, I just want to maybe talk about how I enjoy flowers. You know, if, if Wordsworth can write decades of, of, of talking about nature, then why can't I? Why can't that be considered valuable art? I, I have a right to beauty as well. You know, I think it's Theaster Gates, who, who is a visual artist, who said, you know, that beauty is a right. Beauty is also a right. At one hand, I think okay. So poetry should is a, is a way to address that imbalance, to, to address that power. It's a strong voice. It's a strong form of expression. And we're talking about artists as activists, but at the same time, we're talking about this the, the whole structure of 
the art world putting an obstacle in the way of that. So it's it's also art as a as a display of power at the same time. You know, it's not only art as activism; it's coming up against power with it within the the cultural world within performance spaces because why why wouldn't it when that's the structure which underlies everything else why would cultural life and artistic life be different exactly because it all stems from the same injustice it all stems from the same structures and the same systems of power exactly it's in, it's imperialism at the end of the day. It's the whole concept of empire, who has the prestige language, the prestige art, you know, how art can get relegated to sort of this community noise. And so it's for the community, you know, it's class, there's a massive part in this. I think that's the one thing right. that we really have to pay attention to is that it, we're not just, when we talk about diversity, we must include class, but class mustn't trump things like race or disability or uh, non de- uh, non-binary gender identification it mustn't trump that because i find a lot of the time that class becomes a, a tool to to overshadow or to trump everything else but if, if i think of a culture in in england the word culture often is thrown as a kind of badge of class you know someone is cultured yeah interesting yeah culture is about the royal opera house culture yeah. is about classical music it's about a certain kind of poetry even yeah. but our understanding of culture at the beginning was something so much more broad than that it's about how different forms of uh, interaction happen between people yeah obviously for everyone is is hugely informed by their heritage it's informed by our upbringing and the place we were raised and the music that surrounded us the kind of food that we ate as children the, the kind of family life we had yeah. Did we grow up just with with family very far away or did we grow up with family really around us? How how did we talk to our neighbours? How did we think of the land that we owned? Very different ideas of culture. We think of participating in the cultural life of the community. It's it's such a wide understanding of that that we're coming up with. I think the the interesting part of this as well is is to freely, freely participate. To freely participate in anything is to be able to feel yourself being in your entirety. Just the term human being uh, to actually just be is it's a very rich thing to meditate on. You know, I think we live in such a you are who what you produce. You know, that's the whole kind of capitalist drive. You are what you produce. You are what you own. You are your stuff. You know, you are your reputation. You know, it's just not true. I remember having a very profound moment with my cat one time. Like I was just watching him, just lying in a sunbeam, licking himself. I'm like, gosh, you're not even sitting there trying to cat. You're just being, you're just catting. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? And, and that's what we need to do. When we're free, we're just being in our essence. We're just existing and being in our essence. You know, the whole thing of like the, the right to, to, to life, you know, to life, life is, is our breath, it's our heartbeat, it's that vitality. I think we have to think about culture. If, we, if you think about culture embodied, it's much more easier to, to feel and, and I personally believe comprehend culture when it's embodied. So I think the, yeah. the, to freely participate in the cultural, cult, in the cultural life, um, Again, you know, if I feel connected to my, my, my tribe, my people, whether that's my family or my wider community, because we all know a dance move together and we can express it freely mm-hmm. in a space, that's what you call strengthening, if you like, a synaptic connection. You know, if you imagine us like in a web or like a brain, you know, it's, it's strengthening that synaptic connection. And, and creating sparks for new things to be innovated. That's freedom. Yeah. The freedom to innovate, the freedom to create, the freedom to envisage, the freedom to imagine. I remember talking to a guy, he'd, he'd lived in England for 20 years, I think, came from Eastern Europe. And he said from uh, when he first arrived in England, one of the things that most blew his mind was that when he turned the radio on, everything was in English. Every song that was played was English. And where he'd grown up, you, know, you turn the radio on and you hear music from everywhere. And if a song's good, then it's good. And there was this kind of argument in England, well, you know, people won't understand it. People won't understand the, the, the words. And he knew very personally that he understood a lot from music that he didn't understand the words from. That, <laughs> exactly. that wasn't a reason. Exactly. There was something else that communicated. Uh, but to him, that then became, okay, this is, this is actually also a statement of what's valuable. That attitude that music should be in the English language on radio is also saying this is this is what's important this is the valuable 
culture. Sure. Uh, anything else is marginal. Exactly. Uh, and it becomes quite literally marginal. It becomes, you know, on, I don't know, BBC Radio 22 or something, whatever <laughs> whatever number that non-English language music goes on to, <laughs> yeah. which at the end of the day is communicating something and representing something. Mm-hmm. And for anyone who perhaps falls outside of that or their taste or their, their cultural interest or heritage falls outside of that, there's a big part which becomes not so accessible. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what you're saying. It, it, because it, when you come from a marginalised group and you, you do only have access to a lot of mainstream media, you're constantly looking for yourself. If we're talking about your identity being defined via culture, partly being defined via culture, and you're constantly looking, where, where am I? Where's my culture? Where is it? Oh, it's in the little back room in the cupboards yeah. on, like you said, BBC yeah. 22. <laughs> that's, that's where you go. It's uh, how do you value self, you know? Yeah. And, and especially if you, if you are third, fourth, fifth generation of a migrant community, you know, being born here. But I think I, what I really appreciate about technology, because part of the, the, the article does talk about um, and is sharing scientific advancements. So we're talking about tech, right? Yep. So we're talking about the digital world. We're talking about, you know, technology, having access to technology. What people are doing on social media, what this new generation are doing on social media, like making these like 30 second stories, these 30 second films and knowing that it's only in this square space. It's incredible innovation. You know, again, that's what I'm saying. This is where creativity and art and innovation just like, you know, collide and make something beautiful happen. I have a manifesto. My, my, My core manifesto is I'm in the business of narratives and storytelling that counter violent dehumanization, that builds community. My medium for this rehumanization is the arts as a space for dialogue, for envisioning, reimagining, and focus. So as long as I'm constantly thinking about how is this space facilitating me to counter dehumanization, where we're not just product, uh, when I'm encouraging young people as in mentoring them, I'm very aware that when they come into the space, They come from a generation where they're constantly very visible because of social media. Their whole lives are on social media. Their whole lives are are waiting, unfortunately, tapping into that fragile part of the human psyche for approval from how many likes and how many followers you've got. So there's a kind of social anxiety when they come to the space sometimes. I've, I've found this, a particular generation, as a social anxiety about, am I doing this right? Do I look good? Am I saying the right things? And I, I found this in schools at a particular age as well, that young people coming up to me or pupils coming up to me saying, I've written this miss. Is it right? And I'm like, babe, this is, this is you. I can't tell you whether you are right or wrong. This is your expression. Be yourself. And I remember working with, a, I think she was about, 11, 10, 11, uh, a young Eastern European girl from uh, from uh, Romania. She was writing a piece and, and she said, have I done this right? And I said the same thing. I said, I can't tell you whether or not what you've written is right or wrong. I just want you to be yourself. I just want you to express what, what you feel. And she goes, she goes, so wait a minute. It's <laughs> just the way she said, she put her finger, she said, so wait a minute. <laughs> Are you telling me I can write anything I want? And I said, yes. And she goes, okay, I've never been told that before. So she, was, she had never been told that she was allowed to be her whole self. Just going back to the, to the young people who, who I've, I've worked with who just have come into so anxious, you know. I'm just like, you are, there's nothing wrong with you. And there's no standard you have to live by except, except your own. So just express yourself. Use whatever you want, whether it's photography, film, collage, painting, whatever it is. Just get it out of yourself so that you can be free. Can we talk about you, you, your own work as, as a, I, I don't know the term that you like, a poet, uh, activist? I, I mean, I struggle myself. I realise that um, people need, for marketing copies um, purposes, they need a nice little tidy <laughs> title and box to put me in. But um, I, 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 I don't know. Um, so I've been writing poetry as a tool for calming myself down, for self-care, for, for peace, to have the difficult conversations with myself that I potentially couldn't have with others uh, if I didn't feel understood. You know, I use poetry as that device. So I guess I'm a poet from that perspective, but I, I'm a writer at the, at the core of me. I have to write every day 
if I don't write, if I, I notice the difference in my, my being if I don't write. So I have to write. I feel, I don't feel well if I don't write. I feel like I've got too many thoughts in mm. my head. So I'm a writer. I, I'm an activist in the sense that I believe everybody should be freely be able to participate in their own self-development and their own evolution and also to share that in a group, in a space with others. And then whatever mm-hmm. the outcome of that, I won't say product because that's, I don't want to make it a capitalist thing, but whatever the output of that is, whatever the result of that is, the outcome of that is, if it's shared with others and it impacts them, then I'm like, hey, that's fantastic. I'm happy for that. So I, I'm, I, I like to make projects also that give space for found very enriching um, holistic storytelling. If I have to be an activist to make that happen, then I will be. Then I will step into that role. Because I believe it's something we should all have. We, we should all have a right to to, to, to enjoy um, and to be if we want to be an artist as well. So I make projects as well. So the Fury Project, which is one thing we spoke about earlier, was actually a project that came out from my mother. She's a ch- uh, child of a migrant settler. She came over to the UK when she was 13 with her dad. She was separated from her mum uh, when she was four years old. And this is a this is and I, I want to tell the story because I I want to speak about how colonialism works. It fractures families. It fractures communities. It fractures cultures. It splits them up, breaks them up because that's how it has control. So my mum lost contact with her mum when she was four years old. And we found her again 60 years later, but that's another story for another time. My mum came here and she experienced racism the way she experienced racism when my my granddad did. Um, I'm an only child to my my mum. And there was a lot of frustration I could feel that was suppressed anger, suppressed frustration. My mum's an incredibly creative creature. She's incredibly creative. Never had a chance to express that. So sometimes there was anger there. So initially the Fury Project started with me wanting to explore my mother's anger and then my anger as a woman growing up here in the UK. I needed to do that as well, not feeling I had, a, had an opportunity or a space for, to express my voice. Then it became about black women's anger and perceptions of black women's anger, the angry black woman, the aggressive black woman, when you're just asserting yourself and stepping into your power. Then it became about women's anger. Then it became about anger in general. And recognising that actually anger is this transformative power once we have a good relationship with it and once we, we harness it and channel it. It's a transformative power. It's where you know your, where your boundaries are. It can propel you into new ways of existence. So for me, uh, the Fury Project is about beginning to have a conversation about our relationship to our more difficult emotions. So the Fury Project has had many, many iterations. It's been workshops. It's been a theatre and dance piece. It's been a monologue piece. It's been an art installation. It's been film. So there's that project. And I've got another one now called Create to Transform, which is using creativity to um, to hold dialogue spaces. And I'm actually doing one of these dialogue spaces tomorrow, Create to Transform dialogue spaces tomorrow with Culture Declares Emergency. Uh, and that is a collective. It's a whole movement of art institutions and individual artists who have come together to say we are in an ecological crisis right now. And uh, we need our politicians, our leaders, our people in positions of power to to stick to their promises. But what I'm doing with the Culture Declares Emergency is something called The Offer, called um, From the Roots to the Frontline, which is looking at how uh, the climate and environmental justice movement needs to look at its anti-racist, institutional anti-racism and its diversification, how it diversifies and listens to marginalised voices. You know, it's, it's a, it, that's another project that I created. Uh, so if I'm going to talk about myself as a, as a project yeah. maker, or act, maker or activist, I, I, I have to mobilize where I feel people can make work, um, express themselves, be creatives, and I will push my way and make, make that space for people to be able to do that. So that's how I fall into the activism work. I'm going to quote you quoting someone else. You, you, you assign it to Serena Solanke. Mm. Um, and you talk about movements. So you say any movement moving forward must move at the speed of trust. Mm-hmm. And when I hear you talking there, you're, you're talking about building building justice within movements, building equality and justice within within movements. Mm. But that's not a given. That mm. often, even within movements, there's a certain way you're meant to 
look and talk and a certain way you're meant to speak. I, I think that that's something that goes out as a challenge to every organization and, and every movement that's that exists. And, and everyone certainly listening to this, I think that's that's a challenge to us all to, to acknowledge when maybe that equality doesn't exist within a movement. So people often talk about, oh, we're going to make these shifts and we're going to have to sit in the uncomfortable conversations uh, and, and, um, and then we're going to make this, this new policy or this new manifesto uh, or this new grand statement and we're going to stick it on our website and we've done it. No, that's not the way it works. But if you make a commitment to say, you know what, if I want to see the world change, I'm happy to make a shift and a change within myself, then there's conversations that can be had, whether it's by using art as a, as a device for that or to have people from marginalized groups come in and speak with you about your policy, put people into leadership positions who know what it's like to be living on the front lines, to be living in the margins, and the survival and thriving strategies, you will listen to those and know that they are going to counter, they're going to conflict with the last 400 years of how... (laughs) You do things which is about production, it's about extractivism, it's about control, it's about censorship. You have to shift all of that, those kind of bureaucratic ways of working. And that's going to be a difficult shift. So that's on an organisational level. But on a personal level, there's going to be an internal paradigm shift. It's almost like your own little personal revolution. You may lose friends because you have to speak differently. You have to talk about things from a different perspective. You know, uh, it might be uncomfortable at work because there's going to be work colleagues that don't want to do things the way because they're comfortable because their privilege protects them. People don't want to, to hand over power. They don't want to share, do a job share with somebody who doesn't have the skin color as them. There's all going to be all different ways that your unconscious bias is going to manifest. That's on a personal individual level. And people have to be prepared for that work. And the one thing that it's a phrase that I've coined, which is like privilege denies people the process of an emotional resilience. You have to live in the real world. The real world is that the majority of the planet is actually black and brown, right? It's non-white. You have to come to terms with that. You come to terms with that, then you can start to think, you don't have to be fearful of it, but you have to think about, well, how can I be in the world differently knowing this? How am I enriched by this? So if I come into your organization and I share my wisdom, about how to have a very strong, diverse policy, you keep me in that job. You don't just take my ideas and then go and do a workshop of your own, which is what a lot of people from black and brown communities experience. You don't take my migrant experience and then say, well, I'm going to go and run my own refugee and migrant workshop now. You, you, you don't do that. That's theft. That's appropriation. And I'm just speaking extremely frankly in this podcast because you have made this platform so easy to do. So I appreciate you for this very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Art27 for giving me the space to have this big mouth, you know, to say all of this stuff because it's important stuff. Zina, thanks for sharing so openly and for being so generous with what you've what you've said today. Um, I really appreciate it. I know you're incredibly busy and I know you, your, your time and your words are very valuable. Thank you. Zina, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for having me, as I said. Thank you. Resounding is brought to you by the Art27 Network a network of like-minded initiatives using art and culture to respond to the ongoing crisis of displacement of human beings in Europe and around the world. To find out more and to join our growing network, you can visit our website, art27.art, or follow us on Facebook at Art27. This podcast was produced and edited by Ed Holland. The theme tune was written by Matteo Galesi in collaboration with Sinker. Thank you for listening.